How does a narcissist test their victim? What do narcissists look for in a victim? How do they kind of run the little tests before they decide who they're into? That's what we're talking about today at queenbeing.com. Let's get started. My name is Angie Atkinson and on this channel I offer free daily video coaching to help you discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. I like to call it toxic relationship rehab. Does that sound good to you? If so, hit that subscribe button and let's get going. Would you agree that it's safe to say that we could call a narcissist, at least a toxic narcissist, sort of an emotional stalker, somebody who looks for people who they can easy, easily manipulate and control? And if I said that to you, would it offend you because you are also someone who's been with a narcissist? Let me say this first. I have also had narcissists in my life and been abused by them and I consider myself intelligent. So don't think that I'm in any way trying to take away from your intelligence or your ability to stand up for yourself in this case, okay? But the fact is there are certain qualities that a narcissist looks for in a victim. And that's what we're talking about today. They choose victims and then they go on to charm them, seduce them, push them, mold them, put them into their little victim box, right? Narcissists, because they're not capable of normal human love, they love people for what they do for them as opposed to who they are. One of the things that they do is they feel very angry and frustrated at people who enjoy life because they, even though they seem to enjoy their lives, generally don't. Of course, I'm not talking about specifically material things. A lot of narcissists have plenty of material things. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. I'm talking about deeper things like empathy, like sensitivity, like goals, creativity, different things that you want to do with your life, passions. A lot of the time, narcissists will go after someone who have a strong passion or a strong fire inside of them. But as we all know, narcissists have a way of switching from the amazing, light seeming, fun to be around person that we first met to becoming incredibly critical, very dismissive of people they claim to love. And of course, this just feeds our confusion and our self doubt, right? So I'm going to go over a few traits that narcissists typically look for when they're dealing with finding a new victim. All right, let's just go right through, shall we? One of the first qualities a narcissist will look for in a victim is someone who might have some vulnerability, someone who has had previous experiences that were negative in the whole human field. Let me just give you an example from television, okay? If you've ever seen the show called How I Met Your Mother, there's a character on the show played by Neil Patrick Harris called Barney Stinson. This character, while he's hilarious, and I can't deny enjoying him uh, because he's so outrageous and because I know in real life NPH is gay and he plays such a good womanizer on the show. Uh, this character though is the epitome of a narcissist. So one of the things that Barney Stinson looks for in a woman is what? Daddy issues. He looks for a woman who has been broken, had issues in the past because of something with her father or whatever, and then he comes in and swoops in and does his whole narcissistic love bombing thing, although his are shorter, <laughs> shorter efforts usually because he's a womanizer. So the thing that you have to know is that people who are attractive to narcissists often have some underlying issues like that parent issues or they've been bullied in school or something like that and this has caused them to become very sensitive people and has caused them to want to please the people they do care about and often because people who have been treated this way may find themselves kind of downgrading to from what they could have if that makes any sense so when narcissist sees someone who's vulnerable emotionally because of previous abuse as someone who is easier to glom onto and they can, you know, sort of temporarily help raise that person's self-esteem while at the same time in their minds kind of getting in on somebody who's really too good for them. But they think they're, the, the victim thinks they're not too good because they've been abused and taught otherwise. Does that make sense? Because we doubt our worthiness. It's because we don't believe that we are good enough or that we are worth anything that they are able to get to us. It's what makes us vulnerable to narcissists. The next quality that I'd like to share with you is how when a narcissist is trying to choose a victim, they're looking for someone who is going to be dependable, someone who's going to always be ready to help them anytime they need it. So people who are prime choice victims, they are people who tend to be joiners or helpers. They, you know, if they see somebody in pain, they want to help that person. And that's unfortunately something that an empath naturally does. When you're an empath, you naturally want to help anyone that you see who needs help. So a narcissist picks up on that. Another thing that we are that might shock you, 
is a lot of us have a little bit of perfectionism in us. And now we might not have perfect this or perfect that, but there's something about us that is perfectionistic. And one of the most common perfectionist areas that we have as people who are attractive to narcissists are our perfectionist our perfectionism falls where we need to help people in a perfect way so we might often keep kind of a low profile we're kind of the behind the scenes people and a lot of times we don't want to overshadow our friends and colleagues we want to lift them up we don't want to stand in front of them this of course brings me to my next point which is they want someone who will take personal responsibility for everything, even things they didn't do, and someone who will work really hard for them. So they're looking for someone to be responsible, hard worker, someone who will always comply with whatever assignment they get from the narcissist. So they might test you in little ways, like they might be like, oh, here's 20 bucks, go to the store and get me this, that, or the other thing. And if you go, oh, don't worry about it, I got it. <laughs> Number one, you, you pass the little narcissist test because you're willing to spend your own money. Number two, you don't even think about the fact that they just ask you to go to the store when you just told them you worked all day and your back hurts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that kind of stuff. And then the last quality that I'm going to share with you today is kind of surprising, but it's true. And it is above average intelligence. Yeah, they look for the smart people. How about that? And on the same token, they look for good looking people. Now, I know you're like, I'm not good looking. Well, you know what? You are good looking and and even if you don't think that you're good looking, someone does. The point is, they narcissists look for very smart, intelligent, bright lights. They look for people who are very skilled, very trained, very focused. People who, you know, have enthusiasm. People who are passionate. People who have a lot to say, a lot to do. People who other people are attracted to, okay? Narcissists don't want to be with someone who can walk around you know, looking freaky or scary or weird. They want to be with someone who makes them look good. And if you have high intelligence and you have, you know, a cheery personality and blah, 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 you're perfect for a narcissist. So I know you're sitting here and you're going, well, I'm tired all the time and I'm exhausted and I'm depressed and sad and I don't do my hair anymore or whatever. Well, that's because you're with a narcissist, honey. You have to give yourself a minute and you have to think back to what you were when you met the narcissist. They may have taken you from feeling really good about yourself to feeling really bad about yourself, but somewhere inside of you, there's a person who is beautiful and bright and intelligent and smart and ready to move forward in her life or his life. And if this is you, this is why you were chosen by the narcissist. You have to remember, narcissists are always looking to feed their ego. They want attractive people. They want to get a prize or a trophy person. They have very little respect for weakness. And honestly, they have no interest in someone that just anyone could get their hands on. They want someone that they have to reach up to get. They don't want to reach forward. They don't want to reach down. They want to reach up. Do you understand what I mean? Narcissists are always looking for a better supply, even when they found someone amazing. That's not your fault. It's nothing to do with you. It's not that you're not a good supply. It's just that maybe you have too much independence for them, too much self-respect. The narcissist needs other people to be envious of the person they obtain as their supply. That's why a lot of times they come on real strong in the beginning and they offer you this romance like you've never seen before. It's the love bombing phase. And that's why a lot of times when you get with a narcissist, one of the, one of the things that you hear over and over again is, oh my God, they're too good to be true because they are my friend. <laughs> so once a narcissist picks their target, they'll stop at nothing until they get that person. The bigger the challenge, the harder they'll work. And the more they trash you, the more they tear you down, the more once, once they've obtained you, they're mad at you for making them work that hard if you're a hard to get type of person. Here's the biggest thing. The ultimate ego boost for a narcissist is to take someone who's independent and self-sufficient, strong, and make them completely dependent, completely controlled. Of course, if you dump the narcissist after all of that, it just makes them try harder. And every single time they convince you to take them back, it's sort of like another little notch in the little narcissist's belt. Just remember, you don't deserve it. It's not your fault. Now that you know how a narcissist tests their victim, you know what you need to do to fix it, don't you? What you need to do is have confidence. Love yourself unconditionally and accept nothing less than you deserve. If you don't know what you deserve, sit down and think about it for a while and try 
to figure out what your deal breakers are in a relationship. What will you accept? What will you not accept? That's the question of the day today. What are your deal breakers going to be from now on in a relationship with a person so that you know for sure that you're not allowing yourself to be taken advantage of or abused? Share your thoughts and comments in the comments below, your thoughts and experiences in the comments below, and let's talk about it, all right? That's all I've got for you right now. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life, and hey, thanks for letting me be a part of yours. It really does mean a lot to me. I'll see you soon. What is dog whistling and what does it have to do with narcissists? That's what we're talking about today at queenbeing.com. Let's get started. My name is Angie Atkinson and on this channel I offer free daily video coaching to help you discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. I like to call it toxic relationship rehab. Does that sound good to you? If so, hit that subscribe button. And let's get going. So I got a question in the comments about this term dog whistling. So I got a comment on a recent video, like I said, from Shoes and Boots, who says, Angie, can you talk about dog whistling and by an emotional abuser in a video? Of course, I said, excellent idea. And here we go. So I did a little research and here's what I found out. Dog whistle politics is where this term comes from as far as I can tell. And what I understand is it's a certain type of political message that employs coded language, right? Things that for most people, they don't even hear anything wrong with it. And yet certain specific people will hear it and be offended by it. Does that make any sense? So this is used a lot of times in racism. So a lot of people are calling out our current president, Donald Trump, about dog whistle politics because they hear little words. The idea of dog whistle politics or dog whistle terminology is directly connected to the actual dog whistle because obviously in case you didn't know, a dog whistle is a whistle that you can blow or make a sound of and only dogs can hear it. Humans won't hear it at all. And the same thing kind of applies in some cases like um, certain tones, the younger you are, the more likely you are to hear them. They've done tests in live television audiences where they've done the different tones and People are supposed to hold their hand up as long as they can hear the tone and at the end, when the tone is the highest pitch, only the tiniest little people have their hands up because only the little children can hear them. So that's what that's about. So where did this term originate from? Where did it come from? So in 1988, Richard Morin, the director of polling for the Washington Post, wrote this. Subtle changes in question wording sometimes produce remarkably different results. Researchers, he says, call this the dog whistle effect, where respondents hear something in the question that researchers do not. Isn't that interesting? Sapphire speculated that campaign workers were adapting the phrase from political pollsters. Another person, author Amanda Lowry, says in her book, which is called Voting for Jesus, Christianity and Politics in Australia, she wrote this in 2006, and she used an example at that time of various Australian politicians using big words that were words that were very appealing to people like family and values. And Christians tend to have, as according to her, additional like attraction to these types of words. So this was providing a certain amount of extra oomph for the Christians in the country, resonance for them, while other people weren't quite noticing it as any anything different. They weren't seeing it as the person actively going after Christians because they didn't want to turn off the non-Christian voters, you see? In the 1990s, they started using it in Australia due to the political campaigning of a guy named John Howard. The idea of dog whistling is that it comes from a place of sneakiness, manipulation, and narcissists use this on us in our relationships and that is the whole purpose of today's video so how does the narcissist use dog whistling let's let's talk about that well they do it with gaslighting for example okay so let's say that you are at a party and you have expressed to your narcissist that you feel very uncomfortable with the fact that they would often flirt with people of the opposite sex so the two of you have a deal now and the narcissist has promised you know what I promise tonight I will not flirt at this party, not once with anyone, blah, 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 right? Great. But the problem is that you look across the room and you notice there's your narcissist over there flirting with some hot person of the opposite sex or same sex, whatever y'all are into. And you feel upset by this and you feel like, 
kind of devastated and and as far as anyone in the room can tell they're just being friendly and silly but you look over and you notice that the narcissist is doing that funny thing with their mouth that nobody else knows but you is a flirtation thing right or that means they find someone attractive or let's say the narcissist says something here's another example former client of mine told me this her narcissist would always use the word whore in bed okay now to him this narcissist liked the word whore liked to call people whores and if he called somebody a whore it meant that he found that person attractive so while a normal person if their person said boy what a whore they would think that that part that their person didn't like that person they called a whore in this case this person knew that her person would her man would use the word whore in a in a way that to him meant he was sexually attracted to that person so there's an example of a dog whistle so he might have said in front of a bunch of friends boy that girl's a total whore and in any other situation the woman might be like oh yeah she is a whore <laughs> but in this situation the woman cringes inside and closes down because she knows that means he thinks that woman's attractive do you feel me on this just an example here's another example a friend of mine told me about how she was in a situation where her brother was constantly calling upon her to babysit his child and every single time the brother would want you know her to babysit the child he would a couple days before call her up and say hey I've done this really nice thing for you or I've got this lovely gift for you or here's something that I want to give to you just for no reason because you're such a great sister and inevitably a couple of days later this person would call up and say hey can you babysit at the last minute and would leave the baby with my friend for two or three days well of course this was a cramp in her single lifestyle at the time and it was a problem and she kept saying to him I really can't babysit but he would put her on the spot at the last minute oh my god if you don't do it I don't know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna lose my job everything's terrible so again the gift or the little nicety that happened a couple of days before would to her be a sort of dog whistle to know that okay now in a couple of days he's gonna bring the kid over here and dump him on me for a few days you see and she would inevitably take the child and deal with it because she didn't want the child to be left hanging but at the same time here she was this young single person trying to have a life and her brother was trying to go off on mini vacations with his wife every other week it was ridiculous but anyway back to the story the other side of the dog whistle coin with narcissists they will have certain little phrases and things that will set them off and make them feel crazy and if you use those phrases around them even though no one else around you will know it you will watch the narcissist kind of change <laughs> there are people out there who will recommend that you use dog whistling against the narcissist so for example most narcissists wouldn't like it if you pointed out to them how much better someone else is than them okay for example let's say that you have a narcissist who feels jealous of his brother okay so the brother has always done better in school the brother was the golden child the brother's amazing and awesome and the narcissist has unfortunately developed badly because of that okay even though maybe they were whatever they've turned into a narcissist and now they're jealous of this brother so let's say that the brother got a new promotion well a dog whistle for the narcissist might be saying in front of other friends or family members oh aren't you happy for Bob the brother you totally must be thrilled that now he's making 10 times as much as he was before I mean your mom must be so proud of him blah 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 so that would be a dog whistle for a narcissist and if you did it in the right way that sounded genuine which I know what I said just did not because I was being kind of sarcastic but if you could do it in a way that sounded genuine it would really set the narcissist off and some people recommend that you do that just to get under their skin now I don't recommend that so there you go don't do that because the fact is that it's dangerous you're putting yourself up against a target that is does nothing but manipulate other people in in his or her life from really probably the earliest social interactions that they had and since you are more of a people pleaser and driven to follow you know the rules and not hurt people and things like that you may actually be hurt more deeply by attempting to manipulate a narcissist in this negative way so don't do that only the best thing that you can do when they come at you with a dog whistle instead of trying to whistle back at them what you should do is gray rock them so don't give them any emotion don't let them inside your head and literally do not show it to them even if you feel the emotion inside of yourself don't show it to them just just watch us do this very interesting 
nothing else. That's it. It's very interesting. Hmm. It's interesting that you think that. And nothing else. Because if you can gray rock them and you cannot allow them to see your emotion, they will not continue that same path of manipulation. Okay, now it's time for the question of the day. And the question of the day is, what dog whistles are in your narcissist's bag of tricks? And on the other hand, can you think of things that have proven to be dog whistles for your narcissist? Share your thoughts in your comments. What's the deal with narcissists and money? That's what we're talking about today, queenbeing.com. Let's get started. My name is Angie Atkinson and on this channel, I offer free daily video coaching to help you discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse and toxic relationships. I like to call it toxic relationship rehab. Does that sound good to you? If so, hit that subscribe button and let's get going. So we all know that narcissists like to use money to control us, right? Even just a tiny bit of money can give a narcissist a big old power trip, doesn't it? It might kind of start small, little things. They take your name off the accounts or, you know, they put the house in their name and not your name. Little things. Then it gets bigger. It can go all the way up to stealing, threats, extortion. No, sh no kidding. No kidding. There are two sides to this coin. In addition to power, Narcissists who very often were deprived of love early in their lives, whether it was because they had a narcissistic parent themselves or an abusive parent, or because they themselves could not receive the love that was given to them, they are always looking for a replacement for love. And guess what one of their favorites happens to be? Yep, money. Money is really like the ultimate substitute for love, according to a narcissist. Of course, the way they think, you know, they've got those grandiose thought patterns, and that puts them in a very interesting place with money. See, they think they should have money. They think they do have money even when they don't. And they think they have every damn right to spend every damn penny that they have, they can get their hands on when it comes to money. They deal with reckless spending. Sometimes they gamble. Sometimes they use drugs. Sometimes they just compulsively shop. In any case, narcissists very often have a very confusing relationship with money. So not only do they use it to abuse and control us, but they also use it to prove to themselves somehow that they are worthy. They use it to substitute for love in their lives. Of course, this leads them to what a lot of people call kind of far out thinking, right? They kind of become irresponsible and short-sighted. They think they're immune to what could happen. They go into debt. They commit crimes of the financial nature. They hurt people around them with money or a lack thereof. They lie about how much money they make. They lie about how much money you make. They lease fancy cars they can't afford just in order to appear to have more money. They are greedy, but at the same time, they're cheapskates. At least when it comes to things that you want and need. How about that? Often they live above their means. They think they only need the best things, the things that are the most expensive, and yet at the same time, they expect you to accept the very minimal, the very least, unless of course it's something that they could show off in public and say, look what I bought that person that I'm with. Look, I'm not saying that everybody doesn't have desires that involve money. Everybody wants something, right? Everybody would like to have some nice clothes, a nice place to live, gourmet food, maybe, you know, big diamonds to wear all over the place. Everybody wants something and it's not it's human nature. It's our society. The narcissists become obsessed with money. They worry about how much money they have. They worry about how much money other people have. They wonder how they get more money. How can they keep their money from other people, including their supply, i.e. their closest family members and friends? They think about who they can manipulate to get more money. And this includes, unfortunately, family members who they might inherit money from. They think of money as a substitution for being loved. They think of money as a substitution for affection, for general warmth. That's why a narcissist often, who can afford to, will purchase an expensive gift to try to suck you back in once you've discarded them or they have discarded you. Many narcissists, I was just watching a rerun the other day, accidentally it came up on Hulu while I was working and, and in the background and I noticed that um, De Desperate Housewives, the, the uh, character Carlos purchased, and at the beginning of, of the series, he actually kind of appeared very narcissistic. I think that changed over the series, but his original character makeup was pretty narcissistic, and his way of, you know, soothing his wife was to buy her very expensive jewelry, and that's a common narcissistic behavior for those who can afford to do that.
The thing about narcissists, they spend money even when they can't. They put their families in debt. I, I was mentioning this morning that my ex-narcissist used to go and steal all the money out of the bank account that we had, and we didn't have a lot. <laughs> He would go and steal all the money out of the bank account and I wouldn't be able to pay the bills. I wouldn't be able to pay the rent, feed the kid, the one kid we had together, um, things like that. I would have to ask for help or figure out other ways to do that stuff. It was terrible. And I think narcissists do things like this all the time. Of course, I was young and broke at the time, but but the same, the same type of behavior happens often where they don't consider the family needs. They don't consider what everyone needs. They just want what they want when they want it, so they get it. The thing about a narcissist is they believe that they are entitled to have the best things even when they don't have any money at all. And so if they can't get that, if they can't spend the money, they'll steal the things that they want. They fool themselves into thinking that in fact there will be money in the future. There will be money to cover it. Even if that never happens, they continue that pattern, some of them. Bottom line, they don't have a normal relationship with money. You've got your show-off narcissist, okay? And then on the opposite end of that, you've got your tight-wad narcissist, the one who won't spend a single penny on anything. Still, Usually these are the more covert types because they're not so concerned about external appearances. They're more concerned about whatever their goal is. And so they may not give you money to buy yourself or your children new clothes, or they they may not buy themselves new clothes. I, I knew one person who's now passed away, uh, but he was so, I don't even know that he was a narcissist. He was something though, uh, but he was so strange that he, he was apparently a millionaire, but he was wearing his same holy clothes from like 1940 and living in one tiny room of his beautiful, amazing house, which he completely ignored the rest of the house. And when you went in the room, it literally looked like it was 1940 in there. It was very odd. Look, it's fine to be cheap, be frugal, whatever. I'm as cheap as they come. I'm always looking for the best deal I can find, right? But it's not okay to be pathological about it. If someone in your family needs something and you are responsible for providing the food or the clothing or the home that they need, that's your job, right? Narcissists don't see it that way. They're like, I deserve the best things and that's that. And I don't care if it means my kids don't eat that week. And I don't care if it means my wife has to figure out or my husband has to figure out how to pay the bills when I've taken all the money out of the bank account. But even those who appear generous by, for example, you know, giving big tips, they don't do it to be nice to, like I, I give big tips, I always do. And I do that because I feel like it's a little tiny way I can pay it forward, but it's a few extra bucks, you know what I mean? But narcissists will do it in order to establish themselves as somebody who's more important. They won't quietly write an extra tip on the bill. They will loudly proclaim the extra tip and they'll make a big show of handing them the $100 bill or whatever just because it makes them seem important and wealthy. They always want to seem wealthier than they are, even a lot of times those who aren't. One of the ways narcissists abuse us is through financial abuse. They will be very generous giving us gifts, but of course then they expect us to do whatever they say without question. And if we don't, we're a horrible person. Narcissists will be all about flaunting the money and they will even use it as a weapon against other people who are less fortunate than they. This of course includes you and other family members who are involved. Often narcissists will forbid their loved ones, they will forbid their loved ones from having access to money. This is, and when I say loved ones, I mean sources of narcissistic supply, let's be honest. This is one way that they abuse us by making us dependent on them for our food, our clothes, our home, anything that they can. They will, like my ex, steal from your family bank account sometimes and expect you to be totally fine with it and just deal with it because they deserve whatever they spent that money on. They will exploit you financially on every single level that they can. They will stop you from acquiring your own stuff. If you wanted to buy a car in your name, no way. They'll, they'll buy it in their name so they have control over the car. Sometimes they'll even, <laughs> I have one client who with her ex-narcissist, they purchased a car together. It was in her name and he tried to take the car from her. Luckily, she didn't fall for that one. They will do things like demand that every single gift or financial anything is in their name. They won't pay you the child support they owe you even when it's court ordered. And they'll say things like, what are you spending that money on anyway? How dare you get your nails done? 
you, I know you're spending, you know, my child support money on your nails. That's none of their damn business what you spend your child support money on as long as your child's taken care of. Mm. Is it? Sometimes they'll go so far as to even ask you to have power of attorney over you, which is not okay. They will open bank accounts in your name and refuse to allow you to have access. They'll make you give them the, your paycheck sometimes or not allow you to have a bank account in your own name. They'll ruin your credit by putting credit cards in your name and never paying them. And of course, the reason they do this is to keep you hostage because it makes you have to stay because you can't go anywhere without credit, can you? They'll lie to you about how much they owe and how much you owe. They'll max out credit cards without your knowledge and not pay the bills, like I just said. By ruining your credit, they force you to stay stuck with them. They force you to not be able to go anywhere. You see what I'm, where I'm going with this? Sometimes they'll prevent you from going to work. Like they'll say to you, we're in the middle of this big fight. How dare you think you're going to go to work? Isn't our relationship more important than your job? Well, of course, because if you lose your job, guess what? You're dependent and you can't go anywhere. See? As a matter of fact, one of the biggest reasons that people say they don't leave a narcissist is because of financial abuse, because they don't have access to money. It's the truth. So what are some other ways that a narcissist controls people through their finances? Well, first of all, you have to know that it's one of the most common tactics for control in a relationship with a narcissist. It's often a factor in varying degrees in these relationships. Some forms of financial abuse are subtle, like I explained to you just a moment ago, but in general, it's all about limiting their partners or people. <laughs> it's about limiting the access the narcissistic supply has to money. It's about hiding information about money. It's about controlling. Just like a lot of other forms of abuse, this is an intentional tactic that abusers use against you. It's all about entrapping you in the relationship. Some abusers will do this from the very first day of a relationship, believe it or not, while others wait until you try to leave before they actually start the abuse. So be aware of that. Here are a few shocking facts you might not believe about financial abuse. Number one being, that it is really, I'm sure you already know, one of the very most powerful ways to keep a survivor trapped in an abusive relationship with a narcissist. It makes it really hard to stay safe when you've left someone and it makes it a lot less likely that you're gonna leave in the first place if you don't have any access to money. Like I said, surveys indicate that one of the biggest reasons people stay in abusive relationships is money or lack thereof. Sometimes also return to abusive relationships because it's better than being homeless to them. Another study found that 98% of abusive relationships involve some kind of financial abuse. This is especially true when children are involved. And many people are far more likely to tolerate this for the sake of the children. Here's another thing. Financial abuse is not socioeconomically, educationally, or racially not even culturally exclusive. It literally happens all the way across the board. Just like other forms of abuse by a narcissist like gaslighting, financial abuse begins very subtly at first. And to the victim, it might feel a whole lot like love, concern, being taken care of. Something that a lot of victims of narcissists report that they've never felt before. See how they're kind of twisting your experiences to get in there with you? So what are some of the signs that you might be experiencing abuse on a financial level from a narcissist. Well, number one, you're not allowed to work, or if you are, you're required to give your money to the narcissist. Number two, your narcissist has sabotaged your job opportunities or even your actual job by harassing or stalking you at work or even stopping you from going to work, and you might actually have lost a job as a result. Number three, your family money is controlled entirely by the narcissist. Number four, you have no access to your own bank account, or you don't have a bank account. Number five, you're not included in financial decisions, including banking and investments. Number six, you are not allowed or encouraged to get job, job training or to seek any sort of schooling or training opportunities. Number seven, you've had to write bad checks or even to commit financial fraud just to get by. And number eight, your abuser has run up large amounts of debt and some of it in your name and quite honestly you have no say so about it and you might not even realize this at first. A few more signs. In some cases the narcissist might even refuse to work him or herself forcing the victim, you, to support him or her and in some cases won't even facilitate working by taking care of the kids or other responsibilities so if you need to work they won't facilitate that. Another thing is that your abuser has helped to ruin your credit score. That's a very common one, like I've discussed earlier. You've been forced to skip paying bills in order to indulge certain desires of the narcissist, or the narcissist has literally stolen from you your identity, your property, your inheritance, any of that stuff. 
next step you have been forced to give up any sort of public benefits that you've had or you've been accused of cheating the system if you were able to get any help from the financial aid people or the public aid people. Uh, you may have been struggling financially and your ex or soon to be ex maybe refuses to pay child support while you take care of the kids or the narcissist threatens to leave you or throw you out into the street if you don't comply with his or her requests which you do because quite honestly you know that you can't make it without the narcissist they're all too happy to remind you of this they may tell you that you're not pulling your weight even if you're working full-time they might tell you that you're not pulling your weight even if you're working full-time and taking care of all the things there's still something that you're not getting done to their satisfaction so what are you supposed to do to deal with financial abuse well the first thing you need to do is get in organized and informed you need to get birth certificates you need to get all of these important documents or copies if you need to and keep them in a safe place all right maybe you need birth certificates and social security cards passports bank statements, marriage certificates, documents related to your professional accomplishments or your degrees, statements for mortgage, credit card, etc., personal documents, family documents, that kind of stuff. The next thing you want to do is start saving any extra money that you can, whether this is cash that you stash and store at a friend's house or maybe you have a secret bank account somewhere. Point being, you're going to use this to leave the abuser when you can. Here's a little tip for you from me to you. You can earn a little extra money on the side by taking on freelance work, babysitting, cleaning houses, or gosh, even just getting a part-time job outside the house. Or use this tip I found from Oprah's financial guru back in the 90s, and it's one that works really well. Only spend paper money. Just don't ever spend any change. Save all your change, even if something costs just three cents, which it never does, but always pay with paper money and save the change. You will be shocked at how quickly this can add up. I actually was able to buy my son Christmas on my first single mom Christmas when I was much younger and by doing this. Anyway, check out your credit card report, make sure there aren't any, I'm sorry, your credit report and make sure there aren't any big fraudulent charges on it. If you do think there are a lot of charges on it that aren't supposed to be there, dispute them now because you're going to need to have your credit in order as soon as possible if you're going to leave. You need to create a budget. So figure out how much does stuff cost and and how much, you know, what is a realistic and sustainable budget for me? Don't think to yourself, oh gosh, I'll just eat less and soak my own clothes because quite honestly, it's not realistic. Most likely, you're not going to have a really easy time with that. But figuring out where you can cut expenses when you're on your own, that's going to help. Next up, you need to change your PIN numbers, your access codes, and your passwords. So if the narcissist knows your passwords and your PIN numbers, be sure you change them or use different ones when you create new accounts so they can't keep track of you or, God, steal from you. Worse, right? Next up, be resourceful and do not feel bad asking for help, okay? So look into all the available options for you out there. If the system if the current situation does not allow you to wait around especially if you're being physically or sexually abused my friend you got to get out of there immediately I want you to check out the queenbeing.com emergency resources page for help but also you know do what you need to do talk to people around you talk to all kinds of places here's an example seek transitional housing maybe you need to find a friend or a family member who is willing to facilitate your exit by providing a safe place for you and your kids if you have any or to stay with while you transition from the abusive narcissist and their home to a new home of your own if necessary my friend look into local shelters and programs okay I want you to start thinking about building your credit if you can get a secured card and keep it somewhere safe do it use it to make small purchases and keep it paid on time this is going to help you to build your credit while you can't keep flying under that radar all right of course this leads me to the question of the day and the question of the day is have you been through financial abuse do you know what I'm talking about and what would you add to this list share your thoughts and your experiences Mm -hmm. below and let's get a good discussion going all right thanks so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life and hey thanks for letting me be a part of yours it really does mean a lot to me I'll see you soon it's my mission to teach others what I know to be true you really can create the life you want Take care of your body, take care of your soul, nurture the real you and introduce him or her to the world. Be comfortable in your own skin and in your place in this world. Take your spot, take it now, and the universe will take its cue from you. You feel me? If so, subscribe to my channel. Let's get it done together. Have you ever heard that if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth? That's what narcissists count on when they're gaslighting you. 
Today we're going to talk about seven different ways, different techniques that narcissists use to gaslight us in toxic relationships. This will help you to better understand the person you're dealing with, better understand what you've been through, and hopefully not go through it again. All right, knowledge is power, my friend. Let's get started. My name is Angie Atkinson, and on this channel, I offer free daily video coaching to help you discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. I like to call it toxic relationship rehab. Does that sound good to you? If so, hit that subscribe button and let's get going. So just as a brief starting point, I want to officially define gaslighting for you and explain to you what it is, just in case you don't know. So really quickly, gaslighting is a persistent type of manipulation that a narcissist or other toxic person will apply to you, use against you, in order to control you, to make you doubt your own perception of reality, and ultimately to make you feel crazy. When they make you feel crazy, then they can feel in control of you, and often you'll give up the control when you reach that point because you don't know what else to do. Today we're going to talk about, like I said, seven different tactics that commonly are used by gaslighters in relationships. We're going to start with one of the most obvious ones, the biggest, most painful one maybe. Uh, and that is to dominate you, to control you. The narcissist will behave as though you deserve nothing at all when it comes to having choices, opinions. Anytime you have a choice or an opinion to make, to state or make, the narcissist will minimize you and attack you. They lie to you, they manipulate you, they coerce you in order to keep you in a constant state of insecurity and fear. When you live in a state of fear, you'll have almost no choice but to submit to their will, and that's exactly what they want. Because what happens is that you actually begin to doubt your own perception, like I said, of reality, and question your ability to make choices reasonably, your ability to function on a healthy, normal level. And once you start to do that, the narcissist gains control over you. Now let's move on to number two. I'm going to call number two crumbs of goodness, okay? And what I mean is every now and then you'll get a little hope. Oh my gosh, maybe things are going to go back to normal or how they used to be. Maybe the narcissist is going to be kinder from now on. The narcissist will give you little glimmers of who they used to be or who you thought you signed up to be with. And it's just all false hope. They make you believe that maybe things are going to get better. And believe it or not, this is another form of gaslighting. They will occasionally treat you with kindness. They'll be a little gentle to you. They might even throw a compliment your way, give you a tiny taste of validation. They might even be really, really nice, and they might even show some sort of superficial remorse to you. And you'll go, oh, maybe it isn't that bad. Maybe I can make it through this. It's going to be okay, right? Not really. It is a temporary maneuvering tactic that they're using to manipulate you and control you back into submission. This one often comes up anytime you think to yourself, you know what, I'm done, I'm out of here. That's when they'll start doing this. It's similar to hoovering. You know what I'm talking about? The worst part of this one is that they often use it to further make you dependent on them. And this kind of increases the enmeshment that you have. So it's even harder to leave them when this tactic is used. And I think they know it, whether subconsciously or not. And I think that depends on where they are on the spectrum. Number three, the narcissist will force you into a codependent relationship. I know we just talked about codependency, but this is a little different. What they do is they require you to get their approval for everything. They might do this by making it really hard on you when you don't in the beginning of the relationship. Well, how dare you make, you know, bratwurst for dinner? I don't like bratwurst. You should have known that. And, and the next time, you know, how dare you, you know, cook a vegan meal? You know I need meat with my dinner. <laughs> Whatever. The point is they will begin to pick at small things and that you will become so paranoid of triggering their fear and anger that your first step is always, what do you think, narcissist? Is this okay with you? Codependent is defined by the dictionary as excessive emotional or psychological reliance on a partner. Your narcissist exploits this, constantly pulling your strings, pushing your buttons, to force you to be insecure, anxious, and worried, and not be able to function with your own thoughts and feelings. You must always obtain 
their opinion before you can do anything. And that's exactly what they want because guess what it gives them? Do you know? Control. Yes. So by forming a codependent relationship with you, they keep you in a constant state of fear, constant state of vulnerability, and they constantly invalidate you. Number four, a narcissist will wear you down. That's a technique. Sometimes they do this by depriving you of sleep, keeping you up in the middle of the night or waking you up in the middle of the night to actually abuse you. I did a whole video on that called sleep abuse. They stay on the offensive in order to constantly have you in a state of high stress, high anxiety. Your adrenaline's always going. Eventually you get, you're exhausted. You might even say to people or to yourself all the time, oh my God, I'm so exhausted. And when you do that, you become discouraged. You become pessimistic. You resign yourself to this is my life. You stay scared. You stay debilitated. You're always doubting yourself. Everything you think, feel, and say, is you're doubting it. You start to question your own perception of reality. You start to question your own identity. You start to question the world around you and wonder, am I seeing this right or am I crazy? That's exactly what the narcissist wants. Number five, the narcissist lies to you. And not just lies, but sometimes just exaggerates the truth to the point that you believe it because there's a kernel of truth in it. So it starts like this. They create a narrative about you. And, and it's like something's wrong with you. You're not good enough. And they tell it to you over and over again. They tell it to themselves over and over again. And you begin to be in a constant state of being on the defense. For example, if they think you're a terrible housekeeper, every single time they're in the house and every single time they see anything that looks like not perfect, they'll point it out. Did you really leave that mess on the floor? God, you're such a terrible housekeeper. Did you really leave that spot on the stove? God, you're such a terrible housekeeper. Why haven't you taken out the trash yet? God, you're such a terrible housekeeper. They tell you this over and over. You're such a terrible housekeeper. And guess what? You start to think, God, I'm a terrible housekeeper. Same thing could happen to you from a narcissist at work. If you are working in a company and let's say you run a department, you know, that makes widgets and somebody over here from the Wingle department is like, the widget department is a complete joke. I cannot even begin to wonder why they pay this, this department. Why are you even over there? And they start to slowly tear you down that narrative. The widget department doesn't matter. The widget department is no good. And pretty soon you and maybe other people in the widget department are freaking out going, oh my gosh, we're sucky. Well, it's not the truth. It's just the case that the narcissist came after you because the narcissist maybe was threatened by you or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's a false narrative the narcissist gave to you and you started to believe it because it was constantly going in your head. Same deal with like, say a narcissistic mother. She might, the way you put away the groceries in the house, you put the cans upside down. I told you to put the cans right side up. How come we keep going through this over and over again? You know what I'm saying? It's one thing after another. It's a constant, it's a narrative. They create a negative narrative about you and then they begin to believe it and they begin to ask you to believe it. And you do because you don't know any different. Of course, this brings me to number six. They repeat it again and again and again. So they constantly, if they find a tactic that works on you, they repeat it. If they find a narrative they like about you, even if it's a narrative that makes you look terrible, which it inevitably will be because it's a narcissist, guess what? They're going to repeat it to you over and over again. It keeps you on the defense. It keeps them on the offense. It keeps the stress levels in the relationship high and your satisfaction level non-existent. In fact, you stop caring about your satisfaction level because you're so freaking exhausted. It allows them to control and dominate you on every single level. This brings me to number seven, escalation. So when you come to them and you go, hey, listen, I know you're cheating on me. I saw you kissing another person in the street, let's say. You have irrefutable evidence. You saw it with your own eyes. There's no doubt about it. Maybe you, you even picked up your cell phone and took a picture of it. And you say, see, I showed, see, see, there you are kissing this other person. How can you deny that? Guess what? They will. They'll lie. They'll escalate the lie. They'll say, that's not me. That's just somebody who looks like me. Or they'll say, well, that's my sister, even though you've been together 20 years and you never met a sister. Or they'll say, oh, that's just somebody from work and I wasn't really kissing her. I just happened to look. It happened to look like that because I leaned over to whatever lie they want to tell you. And the more you don't believe them, the further they'll escalate the lies. They will flatly deny that they were even involved or maybe that they were even there. This, of course, helps you feel crazier because the more they say it, the more they deny it, the more you're likely to go, maybe I am wrong. Maybe, you know, he seems really sincere. She seems like she really means it. Maybe I was mistaken. Maybe that person I've been with for 20 years has no freaking idea. You know, maybe I have no idea what they look like. 
Right. They escalate the lies in order to further hold out. They refute evidence with things like denial. Yeah. Blame. Well, I only did that because you haven't kissed me in a month. More false claims like that was my sister, my cousin, my aunt, my long lost mother. They twist the facts. And what it all comes down to is they are trying to create enough doubt and confusion in your mind that you might believe, A, that you're crazy enough to have been mistaken that that wasn't really them kissing a strange person, and B, that you feel confused. And because they are so adamant and so strong about this is really not the truth, what choice do you have but to believe them? And if you dare to question them, they smack you right down. Maybe not physically, but they do it. So, there you go. Those are seven gaslighting techniques that narcissists commonly use against us. Well, I'll give you tips on how to deal with gaslighting. Here's one simple way you can stop gaslighting in narcissistic relationships. Living with a narcissist for a long time can really start to feel like you lose the ability to function as an intelligent human being, right? Stop feeling confident about your looks, abilities, the reliability of your own thoughts and emotions. Narcissists are infamous for their gaslighting and manipulation techniques. You know, the ones they actively use in order to get what they want. These techniques can be psychologically devastating for victims. Narcissists can have such an emotional hold on us that they literally invade our every thought. If someone in your life makes you feel completely worthless or constantly questions your sanity, you might be dealing with a narcissist who is actively gaslighting you. There are only a few ways you can stop gaslighting. The first and most drastic is to simply cease all contact with the narcissist. This is definitely the most effective way to end the cycle of emotional ma manipulation. But in some cases, no contact, as we all know, is not possible. So what are you supposed to do then? Well, simple. You limit contact at least as much as you can. Of course, it's not always going to be possible to avoid your narcissist. So only spend as much time with him or her as you must. Same goes for conversation when you do spend time together. Try to avoid it when you can. And if you must engage, don't go beyond small talk. Stand up. Refuse to cower. I know it sounds kind of silly, but if you've been in a relationship with a narcissist, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When gaslighting happens, a narcissist wants to feel in control, so they do their very best to make you feel crazy. Don't allow them to intimidate you or upset you. Then take back your power and become the rightful mistress or master of your own destiny. But how do you do this? You simply refuse to react in any negative way, other than to quietly stand up and remove yourself if necessary. You refuse to be confrontational, and you watch the narcissist squirm. By not paying attention or giving him or her the satisfaction of a reaction, you cause the narcissist to feel irrelevant. That upsets and knocks the narcissist right off kilter, and he or she might even decide to go back into charming mode in order to get back the narcissistic supply as in your attention. Either way it stops the gaslighting, at least temporarily. So how about you? Have you found a way to stop the gaslighting? Share this video, share your thoughts in the comments below. So now it's time for the question of the day. And the question of the day is, are you familiar with gaslighting? Has it happened to you? Do any of those seven techniques sound familiar to you? And what other techniques have been used against you? Share your thoughts, your experiences, and your ideas in the comments section below. You never know, you might just save the life of another survivor. All right, that's all I've got for you right now. All right, thank you so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life. And hey, thanks for letting me be a part of yours. It really does mean a lot to me. I'll see you soon. It's my mission to teach others what I know to be true. You really can create the life you want. Take care of your body, take care of your soul, nurture the real you and introduce him or her to the world. Be comfortable in your own skin and in your place in this world. Take your spot, take it now, and the universe will take its cue from you. You feel me? If so, subscribe to my channel. Let's get it done together.